Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> you know, after that song that Roger sang for us, I don't think I need to do this. I think Roger just needs to get up here and sing that again. I think that was, I don't know if you all noticed the, the quote I put in the, in the bulletin. It's by C.S. Lewis in a famous book he wrote called The Problem of Pain, which I find to be an amazing book. I'm only about halfway through it, but uh, I don't know if you've ever read C.S. Lewis. It's a challenge to read C.S. Lewis. Um, I don't know about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I never read that, but I think that's for kids, so it was easier. But anyway, the quote, I'm rambling. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. So I thought about that when, when that song went off rails, and uh, we had to start all over, and I heard somebody in the background say, God's getting our attention. I think that's exactly right. We needed to hear that. We needed to hear that twice. So I appreciate Roger that you started over and didn't start again in verse two. So I'm just rambling. Sorry. <clears throat> this morning we're going to talk about pain and suffering. We all experience pain and suffering in our lives, don't we? Of course. In the famous words of Wesley, the Man in Black from The Princess Bride. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says different is selling something, right? I think a more appropriate quote would be from Job, chapter 5 and verse 7. For a man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. In other words, as the sparks of a campfire rise up in a seemingly unending fury, so too are the troubles of man, the pains and sufferings of life. Well, Hebrews chapter 12 teaches us the benefits of pain and suffering. The benefits of pain and suffering. And that's, that idea doesn't really sit well with us, benefits of pain and suffering. If you look around at our world, to suffering seems to be avoided at all costs, doesn't it? We hate pain and suffering. We expend a great deal of energy each and every day to limit the pain and suffering in our lives. We work very hard in life in order to provide food and shelter and clothing for ourselves and our loved ones, and that's because to do without those things is to experience pain and suffering. We try and eat well and exercise so that our bodies don't fall apart, right? I would love to eat a bag of potato chips with every meal. Amen. But I don't because I would suffer for it. When we become ill and injured, we go to doctors and we get prescriptions and medications and procedures and surgeries, all these things to lessen our physical pain. We even pay a monthly insurance rate, don't we? To indemnify us or to protect us financially from the fallout of unexpected suffering and pain. And then there's the emotional and mental pain and suffering we all go through in life. And you can go to a therapist and you can sit down and talk for hours about it and they'll commiserate with you over it and all you have to do is pay them a couple hundred dollars an hour. Sounds like a deal, doesn't it? Not really. There's also medications that will numb your mind's ability to feel the emotions of pain and suffering. And some turn to drink and drugs and other things to do the same thing. You might well say we have a problem with pain and suffering. We don't like it. We don't like it, and rightly so. Pain and suffering, I think, was not part of our original design. We weren't originally designed to experience pain and suffering. We were made to enjoy life in harmony with God and with all of creation without pain and suffering. But because of sin, we know that we now groan along with all of creation. In that sense, pain and suffering is undesirable. I think it's okay that we don't want it. I think only a disturbed person wants to suffer. We should work hard. We should take care of ourselves. We should see doctors and take medications and buy insurance. Those things aren't necessarily bad. And hear me now, I'm not saying you should not do those things. You should, you, you should do, I'm not saying you should do nothing to alleviate pain and suffering in your life or the lives of others. Take your medicine for goodness sake. Please, 
Paul didn't tell Timothy to quit whining about his stomach ailment. No, he told him to take a little wine, right, to help, his, to help whatever ailed him. So don't think today I'm suggesting that we should seek out pain and suffering or that we refuse the help and treatments that we have available to us. Of course, we should do those things. God gave us those things to help us. What we're discussing today is how we think about our pain and suffering, the perspective we should have about our pain and suffering. We know that it's undesirable, but is all pain and suffering bad? Is all pain and suffering bad? Or, or how about I ask it this way, is pain and suffering all bad? Is there something good that comes from it? What if God wants you to experience pain and suffering? What if he wants you to go through difficult times? Would you consider it all bad then? Well, Hebrews 12 tells us that God does, in fact, intend pain and suffering in this life. He intends it. Furthermore, Hebrews 12 tells us that, tells us what he is doing in our pain and suffering and why he allows it. We've all been asked, or perhaps you've even asked the question, why does God allow so much pain and suffering in this world? I was just asked that question earlier this week, and it can be a very difficult thing to answer. I rambled on for like 30 minutes trying to nail it down. When people ask this, what they usually mean, though, is, is why do the innocent suffer? Why does God allow the, the innocent child to get ill or the good person to get sick? We understand why the wicked suffer, don't we, right? Many times, and be honest with me, many times we get a little pleasure in seeing the wicked suffer, don't we? Sure we do. When you see that guy weaving in and out of traffic and, and he's cutting people off and he has utter disregard for everybody on the road and he nearly runs you off the road and then you come around the corner a couple miles down the road and there he is pulled over getting a ticket, it's a little part of you that smiles, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I know. When I read Esther and I, and I, and I, and I read that Mordecai, I'm sorry, that, that, that Haman ends up getting hanged by the very gallows that he intended for Mordecai, there's part of me that laughs. Yeah. He says, that's what you get, dude, right? Yeah. And yeah, we don't hear dude from this pulpit very often, do we? <laughs> that's what I bring to the pulpit, dude. <laughs> I think we understand why people suffer when they go when they do wrong things, but what about the Christians? What about us? What about those of us who are doing our best to love God, to serve God, to honor him with our thoughts and our intentions and our actions? What about the good people? Why would God want us to go through pain and suffering? That's the question. So let me ask you a couple preliminary questions and then we'll begin. Is God all-knowing? Is he? Yes. Is God good? Yes. And is God sovereign over your life, like the song said? Of course he is. So if God is all-knowing and good and sovereign, then what is he doing in our suffering? And why? To what end? What are we to do with what he's doing in our suffering? Well, this morning, that's what we're going to be uh, endeavor to begin to answer. We're going to look at the what, and next time we'll look at the, the why, the purpose, the practical application of that. So allow me to uh, ask the Lord again to bless this time, and then we'll begin looking at our text. Gracious God and Father, we come this morning with a very heavy subject, and I do not come to this lightly, Father, for we know amongst us are many who are truly suffering in a great way. And although many of us are not suffering persecution, as these first century Christians are, uh, we, we do feel the weight of, of suffering and pain in this life. And so I ask you, Father, to be with me, to help me to preach your truth here this morning, and to do so boldly, but yet with compassion, understanding that, that this can be a difficult thing. 
And I ask you, Father, by your Spirit to teach us and to guide us, all of us, including myself, as we listen to your word, as we look at what it is that you are doing in our pain and suffering. I thank you, Father, that you are sovereign over us and that you are good and that you know what's best for us. Help us to trust it. I ask all of this for your glory and in your son's name. Amen. So the author of Hebrews has been discussing the difficulties of the life of faith. In chapter 11, verses 14 to 16, he describes the life of faith as a pilgrimage. It's a journey in a foreign land headed home. In chapter 11, verses 32 to 38, he describes the life of faith as a dangerous life, full of conflicts and persecutions and opposition, pain and suffering, suffering, even even, uh, a martyrdom, perhaps. And in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he describes it as a long-distance race, a marathon. It takes self-discipline, it takes determination, and it takes a right focus, a right mindset to run this race well. It takes a heavenly perspective, and this is what we talked about last time. He's writing this to these first century Jewish Christians who were growing weary in their running of the race. Persecution has left them worn and torn. They're weary, they're ready to give up. So he says to them in verse 3, consider Jesus who has endured such hostility against himself by sinners. And, and why is that? What does he say? Why do we consider Jesus? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart, he says. As the author of our faith, as, as the one who ran the race before us perfectly, Jesus is the one to whom we should look not only as our perfect example, but also as our encouragement and as our strength as we endeavor to endure our race. In verse 4, he says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. He's saying, although you have suffered, and they have been suffering, we read about that, you haven't suffered in the ultimate sense yet. You you haven't suffered unto the shedding of your blood. You haven't died. It hasn't killed you. When we look to Jesus and we compare our lives with his life, our race with his, we know that he suffered unlike any of us ever will. And he did this as a man, didn't he? This is how he can sympathize with us. He knows what it's like to go through the suffering. And he did so at a level that none of us will ever understand. Or no. He suffered in the flesh greater than any man, any woman, any child ever has or ever will. And that includes the lost, even. For a lost man will suffer all eternity for his rebellion and his rejection of God and his son. He will suffer forever for his sin. But Christ, in those three hours, suffered the full wrath of God for the sins of all of God's people, all at once. And he did this as a man. He ran his race all the way to the cross. And these Hebrew Christians, they had not had to endure to the point of shedding their blood. It's true that they had suffered. They were were ridiculed and they were persecuted. Some had been in prison. They had had their property seized. We learn about that in chapter 10. They They were going through a great conflict of sufferings. They... They, uh, they were suffering for their faith, but what the author of Hebrews wants them to see is that just as Christ endured, knowing that God ordained and used his unimaginable suffering for an unimaginable good, for by Christ's suffering we are healed, likewise, when we recognize God has ordained our suffering, we too trust that there's a good purpose in it. The encouragement is that God has not forsaken you in your suffering. On the contrary, he's working out his divine purposes in your suffering. The Holy Spirit wants them, and he wants us to learn that God is using the difficult things in our lives 
as Roger had said, either as correction or as pruning, training either as a means of reproving us when we've gone astray or teaching and training us while we're still on the right path. In other words, when we look at our trials through a heavenly perspective, we see in them God's purposeful and loving discipline. Now, to help them and to help us understand this, to consider what God is doing in our suffering, he gives us three things to consider. And you'll see on the outline, I have his word, his care, and his goal. This first point, the author of Hebrews points us to God's word. He says, the beginning of verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Some translations translate that as a question. Have you forgotten? So whether it's a question or it's an indicative, it's just a statement. The point is, it's a, it's a bit of a rebuke. And then he goes on to, to quote Proverbs. He's saying, have you forgotten what God has said to you in the Bible? And again, this is a, a gentle but firm rebuke. You've forgotten what God has said, what God has written in his word. God starts with an exhortation in his word, and when we fail to heed his exhortations, he rebukes us. And, and when rebuke isn't enough, sometimes, sometimes we need something stronger, don't we? And I think this verse recognizes that not all who hears God's word, not all Christians who hear or read God's words, respond to it as we should. We can be a thick-headed people, can't we? Truth can be forgotten. And it often is. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, he gives that first warning where he says, don't drift from God's word. That's because they had drifted. This is why we need a daily prayerful devotion to God's word, a constant renewal of the mind, Paul says in Romans 12, 2. A daily washing by the word, a cleansing by the washing of the word, Ephesians 5, 26 says, the daily nourishment, the feeding upon, the feasting upon his word. So he's reminding them of just how important it is for Scripture to be at the center of your life. Have you forgotten? Or you have forgotten? Amidst all their pain and suffering, he doesn't direct them to form a support group, to take a pill, to call their congressman, I'm sure there's, there's a time for those things, but no, when we are suffering and we find ourselves struggling spiritually and the temptation to give up is real, where we must always go is to God's word. That is where we find strength and encouragement. The author of Hebrews points them to the Bible. It is in God's word where we begin to understand what is going on in our suffering. And we should all know this, shouldn't we? I think so. But don't we also need to be reminded over and over again? I know I do. What we need to help us endure our race of faith is God's truth, is God's wisdom. And so here in verse 5, he quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. This proverb that was written by Solomon to his son under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit some thousand years before these people were even born. Well, the author of Hebrews, under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says to these Christians and to you today that just as surely as Solomon was speaking to his son, God is speaking to you. The scriptures are God speaking to you. Think about that. When we remember that God's word is written to us, we are far more likely to find in it the encouragement and the correction we need, especially when we are in pain and suffering. When life's trials have us down and you're beginning to shrink back, the answer isn't to pull away from God. It's to run to him. Then isn't the time to forget God's word. It's all the more the time that we need to be in his word. 
And what you'll find is that God's, wor God's word speaks to you personally, as a son, as a daughter, as a child. The Bible is your heavenly Father's letter to you. Does that give you courage? I hope that is encouraging. To know that the God of creation, we learned about him this morning, the God of creation, the almighty God of hosts, he has written this book specifically for you. And in it, you have all that you need to know him, to serve him, to follow him. You have all that you need to find comfort and strength and peace of heart during hard times. Oh, so many times I've found myself reading scripture in a mechanical sort of way. You know, this is my daily devotion. I got to get through it so I can get about my day, right? I don't know if you've ever done that. I've done that. And I forget that reading God's word is not supposed to be a chore. You know, I've got a stack of letters that my wife has written to me over the years. I consider them to be love letters. I don't keep the bad ones. <laughs> there are no bad ones. She only writes me good letters. And every now and again, I pull those letters out and I read those letters and I enjoy them. I love to read her letters. She has such a wonderful way of expressing her love to me in word. How I need to remember that God's word, how you need to remember, how we need to remember that God's word, his Bible is his love letter to us. When I remember that, I can't get enough of his word. And so what does he say here in Proverbs, in this quote of Proverbs? He says, my son, here in verse 5, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So what does he say about pain and suffering in the Christian life? He says it's God's discipline. It's God's discipline. Discipline for his children, he says. Eight times in these verses, from verse 5 to verse 11, he uses a, a form of the Greek word for discipline, okay? It's paideia, paiduo, and paidutes, okay? They're all forms. They all have the, the forms of the same word. They have something to do with child rearing, with raising up a child the way he should go, in disciplining a child, and how important this is to us. God uses the suffering in our lives to train us. There's a purpose in it. You don't discipline your children just for grins, do you? I hope not. No, of course not. There's a good reason in why we discipline our children. We want, to, we want them to develop. We want to extract out of them the best, right? Well, God is doing something with our suffering, and what he is doing is disciplining us. He's reproving us. He's correcting us. He's training us. And he says, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't disregard what God is doing in your suffering. Don't dismiss it. Don't become so focused in your suffering on yourself that you fail to see God in it. And then he says, nor faint when you are reproved by him. We can be indifferent to God's discipline. We can ignore that God has a hand in it, or we can have the opposite reaction. We can become so overwhelmed by it that we faint under it. Like a child might when the hand of discipline reaches his backside. What does he do? He falls to the floor wailing like he's being killed. I think we've all experienced this. Oh, why does God hate me so much to bring this trial in my life? What did I do to deserve this? I know I've felt that way from time to time. The author of Hebrews doesn't fail to recognize God's hand in your situation, in our situation, in our, in our suffering. And then again, don't have the opposite reaction. I'm sorry, I I'm got twisted in my notes there. The author of Hebrews is telling us not to fail to recognize God's hand in our situation. And then don't have the opposite reaction. Don't think that God's just out to get us. Satan loves to whisper in the ear of the suffering saint, doesn't he? When things are not going well, don't we have that in the back of our head? It's either God doesn't care about you, he's not involved in your life, he probably doesn't even care that you're hurting, or perhaps it's, look how mean God is. He must not love you. 
He surely wouldn't do this to one of his children. Maybe you're not even one of his children, we think. No, instead we must have a heavenly perspective on this and what God is doing in our suffering. In verse 6, he says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. God isn't allowing your pain and suffering because he doesn't love you. It's just the opposite. It's because he loves you that he disciplines you, and he scourges every son. God will exhort us in his word. He will rebuke us. He will reprove us, and he will scourge us if necessary. There's nothing unusual. There's nothing unusual about being disciplined by God. This is the experience of all God's sons and daughters. Adversity should not cause us to become despondent, but to consider God's loving care in it. In verse 7, he says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now think about these Christians. They'd become dull of hearing. They'd forgotten the basic teachings of the oracles of God, the, the gospel. They've, they've, they're in need of milk instead of meat. And so they need to be exhorted. They, they even need to be exhorted to draw near to God, both in prayer and in his word, and to not forsake gathering together. Their inattention to God's word, coupled with their failure to appropriate the gifts that God has given us to help us run this race, has left them spiritually immature. And because of this, they're beginning to buckle under the weight of their suffering. And so the author says to them in chapter 10, verse 36, you have need of endurance. And in chapter, one, he, 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 or chapter 12, verse 1, he, he exhorts them, run the race with endurance. And now he tells them that their heavenly father is using the suffering they're experiencing to that end. He's treating you as sons, he says. His hand of correction in your life is an act of paternal love. If he left you to fall away and to do whatever it is your flesh desires, that would be evidence that you're not one of his to begin with. If he didn't correct you in discipline, are you his son? The author of Hebrews says no. God trains his family. He disciplines his children. He says, God deals with you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you're not his, he says. You're illegitimate. Have you ever thought, in times of hardship, what did I do to deserve this? What is there in my life that's wrong? Why am I being disciplined? How have I offended God to deserve such suffering? Or perhaps you've pointed that question at another Christian. What did they do to deserve such suffering? Boy, that guy or that girl, she must, a, she must really be a rebel for God to punish her so. Well, the first thought, the first question that we ask ourselves is a reasonable one. In the context of self-evaluation, it is reasonable to ask, what have I done wrong to deserve punishment or correction? We are to examine ourselves, examine our heart to see if God is shouting to you in your suffering, to see if there's something that needs correcting. But that second question, when we point it at others, that's so wrong. That is to fall into the error of the thinking that even the, the disciples had, and Jesus corrected them in John chapter 9 when they come upon that blind man, and the disciples say, who sinned, this blind man or his parents? And what was Jesus' reply? He said, neither. He says, he's not blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. 
This is so that God might be glorified in him. God uses pain and suffering in the lives of his children as a means of discipline. Sometimes it is to correct us when we've gone astray, so it is good to examine ourselves prayerfully in God's word to seek out, is there something I'm doing wrong? Is there unrepented sin in my heart or in my life? But sometimes it's not as a result of sin. Sometimes it's simply because God is going to glorify himself through that trial. Turn back with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm sure you know where I'm going. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was taken up into the heavens. He was shown a vision of heaven. So glorious, so amazing. And God said, you can't tell anybody about it. How frustrating would that have been? I just want to tell somebody. But he writes in chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, that is that he took him to heaven and showed him all those things. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to, give, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God intended this suffering for Paul in the form of this thorn in the flesh. And, and I don't know specifically what that was. I don't think any of us really do. We have some good ideas, but I don't know. Whatever it was, we know it was from God. It was suffering from God. And why? Did Paul commit some sin that was unrepentant in his heart and God was correcting him? No. No. Quite the contrary. Paul was right on the right path. God gave him this affliction as preventative discipline so that he would not boast in himself. And furthermore, it was so that Paul would rely more heavily on God's grace to the point that the weaker Paul was in himself, the stronger he was in Christ. So not all pain is... Not all suffering is a result of sin in our lives. Certainly, God does exhort us and rebuke us and even scourge us when we stray. But sometimes our suffering is simply God training us. Sometimes it's God preventing us from sin, like pride. Sometimes he's training us to avoid those kinds of sins. Or sometimes he's training us simply to rely on him more. It's God drawing you even closer to himself. In John chapter 15, if you want to turn there with me, Jesus calls this sort of discipline in our lives, he calls it pruning. He says in John 15, verse 1 and 2, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. If you are God's child, your life is bearing fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those are the fruits of the Spirit. They're not perfected in us in this life, but they should be there. They should be increasing as we go through life. These are the fruits of the Spirit. In various degrees, we have them as God's children. And what does he do with those of us who are bearing fruit? It says he prunes us. 
Kathairo is the Greek word. It means to clarify or to purify something. The Hebrew word for pruning means to cut or pinch. God pinches us. He cuts us. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart, right? And it lays us bare, cuts us open and lays us bare before him. God pinches us. He cuts us in order to cleanse us and to purify us. We need to lay aside all encumbrances and sin that so easily entangles us, and God disciplines us and even scourges us to help us in this task. Sometimes he pinches us. Sometimes he cuts us, even when we're doing what we know we're supposed to be doing. Not because we're doing something wrong, but because we're on the right path, because we're bearing fruit, he does so so that we'll bear more fruit, so that we'll grow closer to him, that we'll, 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 he prunes us so we'll bear more fruit. Just that simple. So whether it be for correction or for pruning, God uses pain and suffering to train his children. Now, is this different? Is this, a, 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 is this way of thinking different for you? It certainly is different from the world's point of view, Right? What is this kind of view of suffering and pain and the trials of life, what does this do for your understanding of it? How does it change your perspective on your suffering? Do you disregard God's hand in your suffering or do you faint under it? Or do you see that God is working out his divine, loving training of you? That's the goal. That's what we're supposed to see, what he is doing. Verse 9, he says, Furthermore, we have had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Are you subjecting yourself to your Father's discipline? Or are you kicking and moaning and fighting against it? Our earthly fathers discipline us, however imperfectly they do so, and they do it as seems right to them. And he has in view here godly fathers, God-fearing fathers, not some fathers. We know that there are men out there who are wicked in their intentions and they beat their children. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a, 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 a God-fearing father who disciplines us. And even the best fathers aren't the best discipliners, are we? Sometimes we discipline out of frustration. Sometimes we discipline out of selfishness. We tell our kids, would you just stop already? Would you just leave me alone? You know, we're not perfect. They discipline us as best as they can, and we see the benefit in that. Maybe not in the moment, but eventually we recognize, we grow to understand that our earthly father's discipline was good for us. We needed that. You don't let a child just you know, do whatever he wants. If you love him, you don't. Y'all remember Pinocchio, the old Disney film? I'm sure many of you have seen that. When I, when I look at the schools today, a lot of the schools today, especially the middle schools where the children are completely undisciplined, there's no moral compass in those schools, and the, and the teachers and the staff have no, no, no authority to discipline those children. Those kids just do whatever they want. Remember in that movie that there was that island where all the boys would go to and they're smoking cigars and drinking beers and playing pool and they're just being as rowdy and doing whatever they want. It was that undisciplined island. What happened to all those kids? You remember? What'd they turn into? Jackasses. Yeah, they turned into donkeys. Stubborn, foolish, that's what happens to us if, we, if we're left without discipline. But I'm getting off subject. I apologize. If we respect our earthly fathers for the discipline that they show us, how much more should we respect our perfect heavenly father's discipline in our lives? When we consider what he's doing in our suffering, we understand that he's treating us as sons. It's an act of love 
We understand that he's showing care for us. And because he cares for you, he cares enough to correct you, to prune you, to give you exactly what you need to help you grow and to develop into the person that he wants you to be. And that's our final point, that God has a goal in all of this. And it comes through our submission to his loving hand of discipline. In verse 10, he says, for they, dis they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the, peace of, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. What do you want to be when you grow up? <clears throat> That's a question for all of us. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Not what do you want to be, who do you want to be? Do you want to be somebody that the world looks at? Somebody the, that the world admires? Somebody that the world loves? Or do you, be, or do you want to be one in whom God delights? That is the question. In our suffering, God is producing in you exactly that. He's conforming you into the image of his son. It takes nothing short of a miracle for God to begin this process, right? He takes us dead spiritually, walking according to the power of the prince of the air, and he gives us life. And it takes nothing short of a lifetime of training to complete it, a lifetime of discipline, a whole lot of work. And I know we like to think some of us need a lot more training than others, but we all need a lot. In fact, if you think that, you need a lot more training than you think. We all need a lot of training to get us, to complete us, to, to conform us into that image that we, that we want to be, to that image of Christ. He loves you enough to put you through that. We don't like to suffer. We try to avoid it at all costs, but Scripture tells us that God uses our suffering to train us as a father would discipline his child. And so think about that in a moment, for a moment with Romans 8.28 in mind. We know that God causes all things together for good to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. God uses all things in his children's lives. Even the hard things, especially the hard things, for good to teach us. And with that in mind, I again ask, is pain and suffering all bad? No. Because God is all-knowing. God is good. He is sovereign. Can you trust him in your pain and suffering to do what's best for you? I hope so. Doesn't mean you have to like it. All discipline, he says. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. We don't like to suffer. But doesn't it help to know that God has a hand in it? He's got a purpose in it. And we can trust him in it. Every child of God endures suffering as disciplined from his or her heavenly father. Every single son, every single daughter is the object of God's perfect discipline. And you're either going to kick against it, you're going to fight him through every trial, or you're going to submit and allow him to teach you what he's teaching you. When we face hardships and persecution, pain and suffering, we can listen to the lies of Satan God doesn't care about me, or God is so mean, he must find pleasure in making me suffer. Or we can look to our hardships as opportunities. Opportunities to grow. Grow in our reliance upon him. Grow in our maturity, spiritually. Grow in our fruit. And grow in our holiness. And that really is the end result of all of this. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, he says. 
And isn't that what we all desire? Christ's righteousness in our lives. We want to be like him. If you want the goal, are you willing to go through the training? Whatever it looks like. Think of any analogy you want. The military, sports, schooling. It's all hard. But if you want the goal, you've got to be willing to go through the training. The Christian life is a marathon, a long-distance race, and it's full of ups and downs and twists and turns and hills and valleys. Good times and bad, and it's going to take courage, and it's going to take strength, and it's going to take endurance to run the race that God has ordained for you. He calls it nothing short of suffering in this chapter. In closing, I want us to look at three passages, just very briefly. First is turn over to the next book, to James chapter 1. He says in verse, one, uh, verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, that sounds like suffering to me, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at all the things which are seen, but all the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. And finally, turn back another book to Romans chapter 8. Beginning in verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We all groan in suffering. That's normal. But we know that it is God who subjects us to it so that we, along with the rest of creation, will be set free from the slavery of the corruption that has befallen this world through sin to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's glorification. That's the, the righteousness promised to you, dear ones. And in verse 24, he says, For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? Doesn't that remind you of Hebrews chapter 11? Right? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And in verse 25, he concludes, But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Are you eagerly awaiting God's perfect result in your life? His perfect goal, are you persevering? That's the call. When we, when we consider that Jesus, when, when we consider him, 
what he endured for us, we gain courage to run this race, a race that is nothing short of suffering. And when we consider what God is doing in our suffering, we gain confidence and strength knowing that God is not only with us, but he is in that suffering, using it for our good. And we can trust him. He is faithful. He will not leave us. And next time we conclude the discipline of faith, and I'll be sad after that because I'll have to start coming up with actual message titles instead of reusing the same ones over and over again. We're going to look at the why. We've seen, the, we've seen what God is doing. He's producing in us righteousness. But next time we'll see practically why. Today, now, in our lives, what God intends us to do with our suffering day to day. Bow with me in prayer. Father, these are difficult things that you've laid before us today. But when we trust in your word, they're actually quite refreshing and quite encouraging to know that, that you're with us, that you're there in our pain and suffering. I pray, Father, for each and every one of us, especially those of us who are enduring unthinkable suffering and struggles today. I pray, Lord, that your comfort, that your care would be evident in that, that your spirit would draw them and draw each of us in all of our hardships closer to you. Help us to trust you through them. Help us to look to you. Help us to be in your word. Help us to look at your son. Look at what he did for us and that in his unimaginable suffering, you worked out an unimaginable good. And we have the same thing going on in our lives. In the struggles and the suffering that we endure, whether it be from persecution or just the fact that we live in a sin-stained world, you work all things together for good, for your children. Help us, Lord, each and every day to trust that. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.